not only her passion for teaching, but her love <coughs> of experience and the care that she puts into her friendships and the people that she knows is unmatched. And I think those are three things that sent her to Uganda. Um, when people ask me why I was substituting, I said, well, I'm going to substitute for my friend who's on a mercy mission to Uganda. So I kind of I got in my own head that she was down there on a mercy mission. But she was down there helping and educating and doing what she does for you every single day. So I'm going to turn the time over to Lydia and she can let me know what she does. Why doesn't it happen here? 
because we get C-sections. We have access to hospitals and doctors. These women don't. So they end up in hospitals like this. This is the Chitobo Hospital in Masaka, Uganda. Major cities in Africa have open fistula hospitals. Chitobo is a regular functioning hospital, but they have a VVF, VVF is vesicle vaginal fistula. They have a particular VVF ward in their hospital. That little wee care, oh, I kind of um, That little wee care right there, that, they were colonized by the British, so Uganda's really into sculpting their bushes. So that's right at the entrance to the hospital. And then this is just down the road a bit, the entrance to the VVF ward. Um, before I go into this a little bit, the, the, the hospital was, the VVF ward was opened in 1987 by a nun who was also a surgeon. I wasn't, I didn't know the nuns were, like, could become surgeons. This woman was a surgeon and she came to Chitobu in 1987. She's 76 years old now and she still runs the VVF ward at Chitobu Hospital. And her name is Dr. Maura Lynch and she is, I would never cross a nun. And it's not because I'm worried about God, it's because I'm worried about her. She, she was a very strong woman. I learned about this project from my friend Linda about three years ago. She's been really active in Uganda for 15 years with various women's issues. So the project started with people in Uganda, or people in um, the US, knitting these squares together and steaming them into blankets and giving them to fistula patients as they left the hospital. These women were so happy to receive these because it was the first piece of clean fabric many of them had owned in years. So they were just thrilled to receive them. Linda's people also donated uh, blankets for each. This is the recovery ward in the hospital, and they donated blankets. So every hospital bed has one of Linda's blankets on it. We repaired a few while we were there. As Linda and her husband kept showing up with blankets and donating them, one year, Maura said, well, why don't you bring your friends who make the blankets and teach the women how to knit? Why don't, you, why don't you do that? So Linda said, okay. So about four years ago, she um, invited five or six of her friends to come to the hospital, and all on their own dime. This is not a nonprofit. This is not a, a government organization. This is on their own dime. Come to Uganda and work with these women and teach them how to knit. Um, so that's what happened. Um, this was these these are this is all these pictures are from this year. So there we are. This is the main courtyard where these are dorms right here. This is a kitchen actually in there. And these, this is a dorm. There's another one over here. And these are the women out here in the courtyard. Some of them bring their children. Everybody has to bring a companion to help support them while they go through their surgery. They don't have this hospital staff and nurses to be with the women as they're recovering. So there were twice as many people as there were actually surgeries. So here's some of my compadres. This is Jane. There I am helping with knitting, and this is one of my friends here. This is Sue, and this is inside the recovery ward. And then here are some other of our friends. As different people started coming to the hospital from the United States, they brought their own unique skill sets. Last year, a teacher went to Uganda. She brought magnetic letter boards to the school and donated them. So the women then began to learn, and you see where this is my friend Jessamine, and she's got a magnetic letter board. Over here, I've got a letter board, and we're helping them with basic English writing and reading. Um, there's, this is Sue from the picture earlier, brought a bunch of fabric and helped the women learn how to sew. So here, and some of them, obviously a bunch of them already knew because they make a lot of their own clothes, but they hadn't seen these types of fabric before, just in the same way that we think African fabric is beautiful, they think a lot of American fabric is beautiful. So. So here she is, this woman making a skirt for herself. Here is Sue, she brought a project in making pot holders, which was really funny because we didn't share the same language. We had, we had to do lots of action and movements and things to help them understand. So we had to explain what a pot holder was. And the only way I could figure it out is to take the little sample that Sue had and go into the kitchen and pick the, pot, the lid off this huge cauldron. I mean, they make their beans in these huge, for this hospital, in this huge cauldron, and, and like run out into the courtyard with this lid in, in the pot holder. And they still looked at me like I was crazy. Like, why would you do that? Why didn't you just pick it up with your hand? And we saw people as they were cooking, they just, they, they were, they were tough, really tough women. 
let's see. So knitting, crochet, here's some of my other friends knitting here and here. So what happened? When somebody smells like urine, nobody wants to hang out with them. Many of these women are forced to live outside their villages and outside their communities. When they hear that all they have to do is get to this hospital, then they will get the surgery that will change their lives. They come by the dozens. There were 59 <coughs> surgeries performed while I was there. They hold four camps a year. None of these women share, well, a handful of them do. They share the same language with their companions, but they don't always share the same language with one another. Just in the time I was there, we traveled to a couple different areas where the language was completely different. They had a hard time communicating with each other, and they didn't really trust other people since they'd been treated so poorly by their own community. So what happened is working together, not even together, but just working on the same thing together, gave these women something in common with their doormates. <laughs> the nurses say every time Linda, they call her Jaja Linda, Jaja means grandma. They called me and Jessamine since we were the youngest ones, the young Jajas. <laughs> so um, they said the women don't yell when Jaja Linda's there. They find a way to relate and connect to one another as they are learning how to deal with what's happening to them, as they are dealing with the fear before they have surgery, as they struggle to recover after, and they form relationships that they never knew that they would have, both with one another and also with us. Yeah, was that powerful? Absolutely. <coughs> the relationships that I formed with people in Uganda are relationships that I will never forget. Almost every day, I talk about how I've never seen love like this before. It's not love like I'm hugging you and I'm holding your hand and I'm kissing you and you're my family or you're my best friend or anything like that. This is the most fundamental type of love that I've ever seen. They didn't care about each other's self-esteem, but they would share their last meal with each other. <coughs> when family members and friends died of AIDS and everybody knew somebody who had, they took their children unquestioningly and raised them. When you go to visit people in the villages, and I'll talk about that in a minute, they don't say how many people are in your family. They ask the woman of the house, how many people are you cooking for? Because that gives an accurate number of who's living in the home. These are some of the relationships that I formed. This guy, Gabriel, was one of our drivers, and he was, I call him my Ugandan brother. He was very fun. And here's just some patients, some more knitting. This is, they kind of adopted their own special people from our group that they liked the most. So she was hanging out with Sue a lot, and this lady didn't speak a language that anybody understood, and she lectured Jessamine and I almost every day, but she was really happy when she got a blanket. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so most of these are from the hospital. These two are not. This one, this is Sister Helen. She's another nun that I would never cross, who's from Ireland, so really never, never cross her. Um, she is a phenomenal, she's a nutritionist, and her job, she works for the same Catholic organization that runs the hospital. She goes out with, with Joseph, who also works for the, the organization, and Helen checks in with AIDS patients and makes sure they're, they're eating right and taking care of themselves and paying their antiretrovirals. Joseph educates the communities about gender-based <coughs> violence. He teaches the women that they have rights. He helps the men understand that they won't get away with behaving inappropriately. If those who are interested, if those are, if people are interested, then he'll help them get jobs, he'll help them get education. They have to approach these guys and talk about, you know, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do that. They raise some money to buy a woman a sewing machine so she could start sewing, you know, um, projects to then sell to help make money. They often donate money, but more often it was beans to individual families, and not beans they could cook, but beans they could plant. So then they could continue cooking for, I think one of the families I visited was feeding 10 people in her little tiny home with a mud hut, or mud floor. This woman right here, this is um, on our, we went up north a little bit towards the end of the trip. This is one of the first visual patients that Linda found. This is Jaja Linda. And they were able to reconnect for an afternoon.
towards the end of our trip. I never forgot that I was not in the United States. <laughs> this was a big one. So after like crying over the refugees that I saw in the airplane, and then we flew for another half an hour and got to um, Entebbe, this is what greeted us when we got off the plane. We came in and there were nurses with hand sanitizer and thermometers, and they took everybody's temperature, and they made everybody use hand sanitizer upon entry to the country. I don't know what they did if you had an elevated temperature, because mine was fine. This was a very typical meal, greens with a question mark, just green stuff that I ate because it was green and I knew I had iron. This was cabbage, that's kind of a treat. Beans, beans, every single meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Potatoes, they grow lots of potatoes, lots of different kinds of potatoes. I had sweet potatoes, regular potatoes, they called, something was Irish potato, I never figured out what that was. This is like a non or a flatbread that we ate. There's a lot of influence from Indian, India and Indian food. This is another baked bread. And this is a samosa, which is another Indian piece. I think it was a chicken samosa. Uh, I didn't eat, I, I tried some meat. I'm pretty sure I ate goat. I'm not, <laughs> the only meat I definitely didn't eat was the fish or the chicken. The fish because I thought, well, it's coming from the Detroit. If I can't put my toe in it, I'm not gonna eat the fish from there. And the next that I didn't eat was the chicken because I saw so many chickens running around eating garbage. But again, I was like, I don't want to eat the chicken that's been eating the <laughs> I thought this was really funny, so I took a screenshot. It says, sorry, Pandora is not available in this country. Because, <laughs> you know, I totally thought I'd try. We slept down a mosquito net every single night. There's the mosquito net um, around my bed. Nobody, I think a couple people got bites. I didn't get a bite, but nobody, we all took our malaria medication, so we didn't get any. This is a very, very typical construction site. Seriously, this ladder is bound together by twine, and I'm pretty sure they made it with the stuff left over, you know, that they didn't use for the foundation over here, okay? It was unsettling that I look at my hotel wall and go, that's what's inside, great. You know, I hope there's some earthquake. But that's what they had, and that's what they, and that's what they worked with. These are the boxes that we took. We took our supplies, the blankets, and other things that we donated. Uh, we took those, we had, I counted up yesterday, 16 of these Contigo boxes. Each of us had two, Linda and her husband had three each, because they, they got to ride in first class, so you get to take three to go there. Uh, they were great, I was glad to be able to take all those things, but it was really, you know, a pain, wheeling them around all the time. Other things I don't have pictures of are um, security guards at ATMs with rifles in their hands right there. Like, I didn't want to go to the ATM because of the guy protecting me at the ATM. It was, it was a little nerve-wracking. Every time I saw a child, they pointed at me and said, Mzungu! Which means white person. Not bad, not good, just white person! Because <laughs> they didn't see a lot of white people. There was, I don't know if this is surprising or not, but um, I was the only LDS person on the trip. So as we first drove up to our um, hotel, right, right across the street, guys, there was a building that kind of looked like this, and then there was a building that was complete with a sign out front that said, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And all the ladies I was with, Mindy, there's your people, there's your people. I thought, great, I'll go visit them. But nobody was there the whole time. I thought, well, I, you know, I'd go say hi. Even not, even if I wasn't all the others, you'd be like, hey, we're from Utah, you know. But they, there was nobody there the whole time. But they had, they had real estate. <laughs> oh boy. So here's what I learned from Uganda. There's a couple things. First, this sign I posted it on the Valley website. The first part says Boda Bodas are not allowed in the hospital compound. A Boda Boda is a motorcycle. A lot of people use, they, motorcycles are cheap to buy, cheap to run, and everybody needs a ride because not a lot of people have cars. So people will hop on a Boda Boda for a taxi ride. And a lot of people, men, will do that for a job. This says, strictly no hooting inside the hospital compound. And I was like, what? We are the fun police. We are here to help these women get their minds off this awful life that they have and the surgery that's coming up. So why can't we hoot? What is that about? And I didn't understand until I went to the villages with Sister Helen and Joseph. Hooting is their 911. Every community has their own unique hoot that they use when there's an emergency. They all know what it is, and they only use it 
if they want everyone within earshot to come running. You can see why it's not allowed in the hospital. But how cool is that? That's what got me. The Ugandan people take care of each other so much and so well. They don't wait for somebody else to call the police because something happened. They help. One of our drivers woke up in the night hearing his neighbor crying and making all sorts of noise when he went over there, and his neighbor was suffering so much, I even just put him in the car and took him to the hospital. The only reason I even had a car is because he worked at the hotel and he was a driver, that was his job. He found out that man had bleeding ulcers and malaria, and he just did it. In the middle of the night, after a long day, he has a wife and a family of his own, but he just did it. Everyone that I met in Uganda said, and I misunderstood it, I think, for a long time. Everyone that I met um, would look at me when we told them what we were doing and why we were there. They would say, thank you for the work. Thank you for the work. And for a long time, I thought, oh, they're thinking, I'm doing such good stuff. So they're so, they love me. Later, though, I realized that that's not what it was. They were thanking me for providing work for them. That's what I think it was. Because even people who didn't know what I was doing and why I was there said, thank you for the work. Those are some of the biggest lessons that I took from Uganda. Taking care of your community. Loving on the most basic, fundamental level there is. And thanking those around us for providing work and interaction and relationships. I cried yesterday when I practiced. Okay. <laughs> totally I can't do that. So here's my people. Um, I didn't introduce them all. So this is Jessamine, the young Jadas. Jessamine, Mindy, Jada, Linda, Sue, Barbara, and Jane. Let me tell them about how you guys do. How the bathroom works. Just for fun. Most of the place, the hotel we stayed at was, had, it had a toilet, it had a flush toilet. Sometimes it wouldn't flush. And how the water had to get there from the street. Oh, okay, so that was, in this place that we stayed, this is, um, we, we took like the last day, or, or was it one night or two nights? I think it was one night. And two days and then kind of decompressed a little bit um, after the trip. And we were staying in the bondage. I didn't take a picture of it because it wasn't really about the hospital and stuff, but the old school, you know, the typical African huts, right? They're round with the pointed roof and that whole thing. So we stayed there, and the, there were flush toilets and sinks with faucets. It looked totally normal, right? But I kept thinking when I was in the shower especially, why does it smell like smoke? How does water smell like smoke, okay? And I didn't realize until I got out and I looked, and there was this hill right up behind me with a 50 gallon drum and a fire underneath it. And there's a little girl up there whose job it is to stoke the fire all day to make the water warm for me. And maybe I think the bonded next door. I think there was one 50 gallon drum to two little units. Okay, now this was a resort, okay? This was, right? And, and the best part is the morning, one morning I went to flush the toilet and I knocked the tank off the wall because it was held there like by zip ties or something, you know? It was, so, because it, it's not like, you know, I would have been better with really a hole in the ground, but, but it was a resort, so they were going to give these Mzungos, you know, flush toilets. But even in some places, we stopped at gas stations a couple times, and there was like the bottom of the toilet, but not the top, like the porcelain drain, you know? But I'm a camper, I don't mind. So the old ladies, I was like, I'm glad that Jessamyn and I were roommates, because you know how some ladies have their little routines and stuff. And I'm like, you guys can room together and do your thing. But nobody really complained. We were a pretty tough group. Any questions? How many days were you there? I think 10, was it 10? We were actually at the hospital for a full week. Linda said it was the longest that, that there had been people at the hospital. And it was, did they say that the staff said that the women don't yell at each other anymore? They don't yeah. yell when, when uh, we're there. I think their minds are, you know, somewhere else because they have these fun little projects. They do. When a woman goes in for surgery, how long does she stay? What's her recuperation? 
they, there were women who had surgeries and recuperated within that week that I was there. They stayed there for the whole time. They have the, the longest recovery isn't really their strength as much as just making sure that it worked. So they have to kind of, and they have to have a catheter in for, a, you know, a, a, I think it's two days after the surgery. So then when they pull the catheter, then they can say, okay, is it holding? <laughs> you know? Um, so, but there were women who left while we were there. These doctors, there were three doctors there, and they did, a, in addition to Dr. Mora, who, they went through 12 plus surgeries a day. I mean, they just circulated them through, and they, they really knew how to, you know, take care of stuff. And it was really sweet. You know, you saw pictures of some women in hospital beds that were knitting and sewing and doing these things. It was such good occupational therapy for them as they were trying to recover. There was one little girl that was carrying around. They don't have cat bags, right? So they had, I, don't, I think there was a couple pictures, but they had like a little bucket that their little calf tube was tied to, and they just walked around with this little bucket. And so they, they'd come out, you could tell they were fresh from the you know, surgery. They'd come out to the courtyard, and they'd have their little bucket, and they'd come and ask if they could sit. I bought a mat, one of those mats that they were sitting on, and they'd ask if they could, I would have to invite them, actually. They wouldn't ever ask to sit on my mat. And when I did say they could, they'd take their shoes off which was just so, I mean, that kind of just basic fundamental respect was amazing. And um, they'd sit down and then work on it. But then you could tell, like this one little girl I'm thinking of was just, I could tell she was hurting. Did you say little girl, how old? Oh, there were 14, 15, oh. 16, 17 year olds. That old lady that lectured Jessamine and I for the whole time she was there, she was the oldest one and she was in her early 60s. But, so she'd been suffering probably for a long time. But that was the thing about these women, you guys, they lose the baby. So these young girls are either forced into marriage, okay, sometimes they're raped, sometimes they just have a boyfriend and got pregnant, that happens, right? Um, and then they have this awful experience, they lose the baby, and they're leaky. And nobody wants to hang out with them anymore. So, it, I mean, it's just absolutely devastating. And then they get there, and some women do lose their baby, so they're watching all these other women who are nursing their babies. It's just this really complex dynamic of, of emotion. When you have, like, what do people do there for jobs? What? Um, a lot of them, a lot, a lot of them sell. So there's the Boda Bodas. There's a lot, tons of Boda Bodas. If you know about microloans, microloans are very popular there. We sell microloan stores everywhere. Microloan is a really small loan, like fifty or hundred American dollars. That, you can use to just start a small business and you repay slowly over time. Um, so there's lots of Boda Bodas. A lot of people sell things at the market. People are always selling clothes. Sometimes they'll make clothes or fabric stores. So sometimes they'll make clothes. I think more women make clothes and wear them than make them and sell them. A lot of people will raise pigs. They'll raise pigs, they'll raise goats or other livestock, not a lot of cows. It was interesting, we noticed as we traveled around that the thinner the cows were, the poorer the area was that we were in. In the area with the falls here, um, that's a very, it's called Sippy Falls. If you're a coffee drinker, you've heard of Sippy Falls or Sippy Valley Coffee. So that's a very well-known area for coffee. We watched a coffee-making demonstration that took forever because the guy had to boil his own water. That was another thing, too, the water. People said, what do you learn, or what do you, are you more grateful for what you have? And I've always been really grateful for what I have, but I'll tell you what, when I turn on the faucet, I, do, I don't have to go get water 10 times a day. And I know my water is clean. And these guys have to go get, they have to just go get water, and you just hope that it's clean. And sometimes they can heat it to boiling, and sometimes they can't. Do kids go to school? Education is free until, I'm so glad you said that because it was in my notes. Education is free until sixth grade, age 12. Then you have to pay. And every time I asked about how to, like, how do you become a teacher, because Gabriel, a Ugandan brother, said, well, I have a school. Will you support my school? I'm like, well, where did you go to college? What? 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 How did you get a license? We just opened a school. I'm like, okay, where did you learn about your trade? And he couldn't really answer me. And when I spoke to other people who were also educators, they couldn't really answer me too about what, you know, about how they how they became qualified 
to be teachers. Not to say that they were teaching kids, because I think they probably were, and it's better than nothing, but if these people are going to get themselves out of their situation through education, they have to they have to do something that they can at least put on paper to show that they, you know, that they learned some stuff. That was that was one of the most devastating things for me too, is just the access to education. I believe so strongly in access to public education and the fact that these people couldn't get to school. And a lot of times the kids just quit because their parents can't afford it, or if they're a bunch of kids, parents pay for the boys to go to school, but not the girls. It was like 80 degrees the whole time. It was it was muggy, like Hawaii. Well, you know, it was tropical s palm trees everywhere. Hibiscus, that picture of me with the fire in my hair, that was, I was like, hibiscus, oh my gosh, like a whole head of them. It rained pretty hard one day. I did go visit like a legit Catholic school one day, and um, it rained pretty hard while I was there. That school was pretty fascinating. These cute girls applauded when I told them I was a teacher. Oh. <laughs> You're gonna make me cry. Linda and her husband, and even Jane actually, maybe she doesn't want me to know, but I'm telling her anyway, sponsor young ladies when they find a candidate that they believe has enough family support that they can go through a, an education program, then they find them the Fistula Foundation often will support young girls who've received the surgery to get their education. But sometimes it, that it's kind of hard to find. We were looking at some patients who were good, but they'd say, well, I'm married, I'm going to go home and have my babies. How far did the women have to come in terms of the hospital? That's a hard one. We don't, we don't really know. Captura, was, where that first patient was from, that was like an eight-hour drive. In a, you know, it was, some come from really far. Far enough that when they get pregnant again, they have to get a C-section. They, they're told this when they recover. If you get pregnant again, you have to get a C-section. So when you feel the baby move, start walking towards Chitoku. Babies move at three months. Is that still in place? Yeah. Well, and yeah, for now. I mean, there's a, there's a hospital in Mbali, a few on the map from before. There's another um, hospital in Mbali, but really those are the two biggest ones. And it's free, they just have to get there. And do they go through walks? A lot of them walk, sometimes they sometimes they, they can catch rides. In my class, there were stories about women who finally got the money for bus tickets, and then once they got on the bus, the people on the bus made such a fit about their smell that the bus driver gave them their money back and I think we're going to have to go back to class for a minute.